doing uh, meeting and since we've met in person to do such talks. So I want to begin by expressing my deep gratitude to the workers of Unite Here, Local 5, uh, and the unions, organizers, and staff. Uh, of course, we take our lead in this research from them. Many thanks to Kate Watanabe uh, of Local 5 and Mary Oaks and Tony Doronio of the Hawaii Workers' Center for being so generous with their time. As many of you know, the Rich and I have been involved as community supporters of Local 5 since the early 2000s. Uh, we also thank our colleagues in ethnic studies for their intellectual and you know, moral support for this work, especially Daviana McGregor, who encouraged us to embark on this research. I want to give a big shout out to my women in work uh, students from tw fall 2020. They worked, uh, they, they did service learning with Local 5 and you know, some of their findings will be reflected in this uh, research that we are sharing with you. And I'm happy to say that this research will be forthcoming as an article in the Anthropology of Work Review. Um, it is part of a special issue on immunocapitalism. So the last two years have been a good time to think about contagion and immunity and all of that. So uh, today, um, you know, we'll be focusing our presentations on the ongoing efforts of local five members to implement COVID-19, that is pandemic conscious and public health oriented workplace measures and workers worker protections in order to secure the well-being of all hospitality workers, not just union members, their communities and the tourists. They do so under immense pressure to bring back tourism in full force. And this pressure is exerted by hotels, the state and local governments, corporate lobbyists, and even as the pandemic lingers on. Uh, we situate the local five workers as producers of expert knowledge about a safe reopening and the ways in which the hotel uh, hotels need to uh, respond to the pandemic. We document the workers' resi resilience, creativity, and persistence when confronted with the voracious appetites of COVID-19, of course, as a virus and what we are calling autoimmune capitalism. The time period that we are going to be covering, you know, starts with the initial infections in March 2020, and then uh, we will go into the reopening of tourism in mid October 2020, and we'll bring it up to the early sort of to early 20, 2022 when the Omicron variant surged. And you may remember how frightening those numbers were. So, with the onset of the pandemic, um, it you know in uh, March 2020, 8,000 of the 8,500 uh, local five uh, members uh, were furloughed. So that's a you know, big part of the workforce. Um, and being furloughed did not mean that they were disengaged with the union. In fact, as we showed, they threw themselves in the work of organizing. Wanted to um, you know, say a quick word about the demographics of hotel workers. As most of you know, this occupation is dominated by immigrant workers. Uh, it is uh, of the groups that are overrepresented are the Filipinx workers and the Micronesian workers uh, in the hotel industry, uh, in the feminized job of housekeeping, 86% are immigrant. Uh, you also know that the, the industry as a whole, which is a service industry, depends on the commodified uh, care work of these workers, uh, which and something that we call social reproduction. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, uh, you know, the turn to this next slide uh, to talk about to to you know place this uh, this graph in the context of the composition of the workforce that I shared. Um, what we see here is, you know, uh, census data that Rich uh, put together as a bar chart, uh, broken down into the racial ethnic groups. And uh, as you see, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders experienced the greatest vulnerability, both to the likelihood of unemployment once COVID-19 set in, as well as the likelihood of being infected by the vi virus. So uh, other research have similarly has similarly pointed to this kind of vulnerability that uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders particularly suffered. Um, when we disaggregate this uh, group Asian, the census category Asian, we also find out that the Philippinex community that is overrepresented in hotel work is uh, more likely to have been become unemployed and more likely to have been infected by COVID. 
Uh, we can talk about the data deficiencies that you know you see in the African American category in Q and A. And you know the point that I want to make is that despite the lack of disaggregated data, this bar graph paints an alarming picture of how the immigrant and Native Hawaiian working people of Hawaii were impacted by COVID nineteen. So now I'll turn it over to Rich, who will present a stark visual representation of the relation between tourism, uh, the dollars generated by tourism and COVID-19 deaths. And it is one register of our title, Dying to Work. Thanks, Monisha. Um, I just, I wanna take a minute and let you kind of scan over uh, this bar graph uh, and, and then I'll, I'll walk through it. Uh, it. It really struck me when I, put these numbers into a graph. Uh, and um, yeah, I just, I'll, I'll give it a minute or two before I, or not a minute or two, a few seconds before I start. So to start with the conclusion, uh, what's going on here is every time since reopening, uh, upon reopening and uh, with each rush afterwards, when tourist revenue spiked, deaths did a month and a half later. Uh, so this was both foreseeable and I believe foreseen uh, sort of cost of doing business. Um, a rather morbid statistic, I worked out how many million dollars a life was worth. Uh, so if you ever wanted to know that, you can probably do the maths and figure that out from this graph, how much the state values your life. Uh, and uh, let's walk through this then. So um, the green, both in the numbers, the dates and the bars uh, represents tourist revenue in uh, millions of dollars. So this is $1.8 billion for March, 2020 uh, and 200 million here. Um, and uh, the dates, if you notice, don't line up. So this was the key to understanding this data for me, is that the incubation period is a couple of weeks, and then about uh, a month to two months in is when the, um, the people who died, died. That's about how long it took. So between a month and two months. So. Uh, I offset the graph. Basically, what these red lines are is echoes of the tourist industry that I've moved back into the, or, you know, to show the the correlation clearer. Um, so, uh, oops. Um, starting on the left, uh, the the mythology that. Uh, the governor and uh, the Chamber of Commerce and lobbyists promoted uh, at the beginning of COVID was that it was not from tourism that it started here. It was actually a local person who was away in Las Vegas six weeks before. Uh, and uh, that that is the person that was the first reported case. And the cause of it was a local person going to Las Vegas and coming back, not tourism. Now, uh, six week incubation period for COVID is um, not true. Uh, and the people that said this knew it. Uh, if you're infected, it, the symptoms start to manifest in about a week. Uh, so six weeks is long past the window. So the person who got it, uh, who first manifested the symptoms, uh, got it from somewhere after he got back. Uh, and what we see here is that uh, the January revenue before there was the shutdown, uh, there were a number of COVID cases that line up with that. So what's much more likely is tourists did bring in COVID uh, and the state covered it up. Um, so uh, that sounds a little conspiratorial, but bear with me because the, the um, circumstantial evidence just piles on beyond belief. Um, so then with the shutdown, uh, at first there weren't any deaths, but then there was a spike due to community spread. Uh, then uh, a lull as education and uh, the uh, effects of the shutout uh, 
taking effect and the deaths reduced and then spiked again uh, in September and October, but we're on the way back down uh, when we reopen. Now, I want to point out this is a substantial number of deaths here and no revenue. Uh, so what's going on here is all community spread, and it's also pre-vaccine. So this is before the vaccine, while we were still learning about the virus, uh, and uh, it's as people became educated, uh, the numbers came down to the point where um, the state of Hawaii uh, was held up as a model for how to control COVID uh, because we were one of the least affected states. So other states had numbers like three and four times this. Uh, so Hawaii was held up as a model. Then we reopened and reopening was supposed to be phased so that if things got bad again, uh, you could move back a phase. So the, the option was there to shut tourism back down again. Uh, but it turned out that things got much worse uh, with the Delta variant and then Omicron. Uh, but the the reopening was ratcheted. So once it was opened, they would not close it again. Yes. Nine month period where the state is closed and you have no the green grass, there's still any visitors coming in. Does it also take account um, military personnel and people that were coming in? Because I know there was a time where we were shut down, but there were local activists and people interacting with tourists who were not being inside of social behavior and using more of like, <clears throat> I remember seeing things on social media where people were kind of hiding out in Monokai and where Manalo beaches, and they weren't, they weren't following Hawaii state law, mm -hmm. not being on the beach and things like that, because I, and then also the military that was in and out because they don't stop. And so yeah. So the military was exempt from reporting their numbers. Uh, so the, we we don't have numbers for the military. Uh, and I'm sure that played a role. Uh, we don't have any way of gauging how much, though. Uh, this is also why the uh, the figures in the previous graph are, are seem off for African-Americans, too, is because many of them are military and uh, the uh, there was no reporting. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's th definitely a factor, but we didn't know how to weigh it. So we set the military aside for, for this presentation, but it's a huge factor, of course. Um, and, and I would point out like Bernadette Gonzalez's work and Hoko, Hoko, um, Hokolani Aikau's work, uh, on, um, uh, militarism. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of good work being done there. Um, and uh, let me continue walking through this, though. So immediately upon reopening, well, not immediately, but six weeks later, uh, without a vaccine, there was a huge spike that dwarfed all of the other uh, deaths. Uh, so the, remember, this is revenue in millions of dollars, and these are deaths. So the infection rates follow along at a slightly earlier phase, uh, but that just made the, the graph too complicated. So I, I reduced it to these two. Um, then uh, during summer 2021, as things ramped up for the summer rush uh, and the Delta variant arrived, uh, we have another spike in deaths. Uh, and then for the holiday rush of 2021, uh, which was greeted by Omicron variant, uh, the hospitals were strained for the summer 2021 rush, uh, but the holiday rush, uh, there were many, many, many more infections, uh, but Mayor Blangiardi uh, and now the state had devolved uh, the uh, uh, managing of the, of, of the pandemic to the cities and counties, uh, like Ige just kind of washed his hands of it. Um, so the mayor said, uh, well, yes, Omicron is much more infectious and there's lots more infections, but there, the, it's way milder. So what he left out, though, is the lots more infections meant even when it was way milder, there were the same number of deaths. Uh, so deaths again spiked uh, and Blangiardi turned a blind eye to it and blamed uh, 
uh, community spread. So uh, it was denied that tourism has anything to do with these numbers. Uh, the blaming took place uh, particularly on Micronesian communities, but uh, the Chamber of Commerce, doctors, uh, the governor's Department of Health, and, and many people together pointed out community spread as the source of the problem. Uh, but what we're showing here very clearly is that when tourist dollars go up, uh, the, disease, the disease continues to be re reintroduced, so it can't go through the usual population cycle and die out because there's continual new infections being brought in. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, right now, I just want to point out that this was both foreseeable. There's plenty of work on uh, uh, pandemics in tourist economies. Uh, if you look at our paper, we've got them cited. Uh, and uh, it was both foreseeable and foreseen. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Monisha. Yeah, so, you know, the driving question for this paper was why would the hotel industry create these kinds of conditions that really, you know, put their workers at lethal risk? Uh, and these workers are central to their operation, right? Of course, you know, we saw this kind of dynamic play out uh, in the case of those who were labeled essential workers uh, during the pandemic. So meat packers, warehouse workers, nurses, grocery workers. However, tourism is not an essential industry, but care work in tourism is essential. After all, the tourist leisure depends on tourist labor. Um, so to bring back tourists would mean that workers in congregate spaces would, you know, contract the virus and then take them back to the community, and there is plenty of opportunity for the virus to spread. The answer to this question, um, you know, uh, this morbid question, it lies in the financialization of the hotel industry, and this financialization is affected by the ultra rich, the investment firms that they engage, the state and the lobbyists. And in the process of financialization, they no longer recognize the workers who are central to their operation, uh, central to their profit generation as part of that whole complex. So we decided to use a biological metaphor to explain this. And we conceptualize this process as autoimmune capitalism, where late capitalism has literally turned on itself in an autophagic process. So in thinking about autoimmunity, we follow feminist disability scholar Beth Ferry's uh, conceptualization, and we challenged ourselves to think outside of the binary of self, non-self, attacker, attacked, internal, external, because the so-called enemy that is attacking the body is the self-same, right? This approach allows us then to trace the interdependencies among these various actors to expose the abstraction and the externalization that is facilitated by financialization. We also reveal the invisibilization of essential care work that scaffolds tourism. We document the radical care that local five workers extend to their communities in the form of mutual aid uh, in order to affect collective change. So uh, Rich is gonna go into the autoimmune capitalism a little bit after this. Okay, so uh, what is autoimmune capitalism in its workings? Uh, so I need to cover three things uh, and then a fourth one that doesn't have a, a, an image for it. Uh, but our approach is by thinking of um, thinking of tourism as an assemblage that we centered workers in this assemblage, but you could center any group uh, and uh, uh, the focus that we're looking at is the shifting dynamic of relations. So if you looked at these relations as all being carriers of meaning, not just the things, uh, then, uh, and kind of being in motion, it's sort of easy to picture this in motion. Uh, if, you know, um, I guess it depends on what drugs you took in your youth. Um, so uh, the uh, assemblage though, is the shifting states of relations. Uh, and that underscores for us the interdependence and mutuality that Monisha was just talking about. So this gives us a way of talking about that. And what may involve a little reorientation is focusing on the mutual relations as much as the nodes. 
So um, I want to talk a little bit about financialization because uh, this is a process that's been going on for a long time, at least a decade uh, and maybe as long as capitalism. Uh, I first became aware of it when uh, the tokens that uh, uh, taxi drivers in New York use, be the medallions uh, became a form of currency that was invested in by people who have nothing to do with taxis. Uh, so financialization is uh, the turning of uh, something that does one thing into an investment. And uh, so here we've got financiers who invest through these things called real estate investment trusts in uh, the land that the hotels are on. Uh, so um, uh, that land is exploited uh, by the corporations and financiers uh, in order to uh, provide and sustain tourism. Um, workers are also exploited this way. Uh, and what happens is that uh, everything uh, becomes a resource to be mined. So everything in, in that assemblage becomes something to extract from. Uh, and uh, the way this worked is that uh, I'll use the Hilton Hotel example. So the Hilton Hotels used to be a single company. Uh, now they aren't. There are three different companies. One is a, a, a REIT, the Research uh, or Real Estate Investment Trusts that I was just talking about. Uh, one is managing the hotels. And then the third is marketing uh, vacation destinations. So uh, there's three different corporations that comprise the Hilton Hotels. So this disaggregation of a company seeking to make a profit on its hotels into three different things uh, uh, comes from the financialization. And the way financialization works, uh, and I don't know the details for the Hilton companies, but uh, the way this works in general is um, a hotel would uh, approach financiers for a loan to expand uh, their operations. Um, the ultra rich invest capital in that. And what they're looking for is return on investment. OK, and that's an important term to keep in mind, return on investment. And what they want is low risk, high return and exclusivity and protection. They don't want other people to have access to the, the means that they do. Uh, so the financiers basically uh, take that capital and say, you can borrow it to the corporations, but only if you use the money not to expand the way you were going to, but to leverage that with the banks and uh, take out a much larger loan using that as capital and expand exponentially more than you asked. So they would say, we're not only gonna give you what you asked for, we're gonna give you way more. Uh, and what this does is sets up loans and debt, uh, which provide a steady stream of interest and uh, maintenance income uh, that come before all else. So before anybody else gets a cut, before any stockholders get a cut, uh, that interest rate that goes back to the financiers where it gets laundered in shell companies that are offshore to avoid taxes and scrutiny. Uh, and then this is kind of <laughs> a word that I love. It comes from alchemy, uh, the you know where you make gold out of baser substances. Uh, and the, the idea is you make it into something nobler. So that nobler uh, thing is the return on investment that goes washed of all tax duties and other responsibilities into the hands of the people that need it, the least the ultra rich. Um, so this is barely sustainable for the hotels during a good times, uh, but a crisis like COVID throws into relief what we're calling autoimmune capitalism uh, because of the decisions that must be made to keep the hotel paying off its loans. Um, so these are the same instruments that were used during the 2007 banking crisis, expanded to other, other domains. Uh, and the idea for the wealthy and the financiers is to own the casino instead of betting in it. So the only way to make money at gambling is the folklore about it is, is to own the casino. 
uh, and that's what's going on here. So stock market is gambling, uh, but the ultra rich are getting their return on investment as a steady low risk income. Uh, so uh, here's our assemblage, the way it appears to the financiers under uh, autoimmune capitalism. So uh, basically all of these and all of these relations are flowing toward return on investment in uh, the financiers and the ultra rich. So for example, the environment becomes a, a resource to be mined uh, to get that return on investment through the real estate investment trusts. Workers are a resource to be mined, to be paid as little as possible, uh, to do the most work possible. Uh, corporations themselves, become targets of, of the autophagy uh, because if the loans fail, the corporation basically gets hollowed out into a shell. Uh, my favorite example of that is a little bit of an aside, but if you see the Bell and Howell ads for cheap flashlights, that used to be an actual company that was you know a leading tech company, uh, but all that was left was the name. So what happens is the, the, uh, the insides of the corporations get pulled out uh, in order to provide this return on investment. Uh, I'm not asking anyone to feel sorry for corporations. They're the, the least um, sympathetic group here. Uh, and then the last thing is that the, these groups, the corporations and uh, the financial sector in, and use ultra rich investment in order to pay for lobbyists uh, the American Hotel and Lodging Association and the Professional Association of Innkeepers are national and international uh, lobbyists. Uh, here we have the Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association and the Hawaii Hotel Alliance. Uh, but much of the investment in lobbying takes place at lower levels than this. So the Park Hotel's uh, land management branch of Hilton, for example, uh, has put in $600,000 to various local politicians in the past few years. Uh, over a million dollars has been spent lobbying just on hotel real estate uh, since the beginning of COVID. Um, and one other thing is that uh, the lobbyists had access to the legislators throughout COVID. Uh, Local 5 did not and citizens did not. The Capitol was shut down to everyone but lobbyists. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Monisha with that. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, one of the points that we are trying to make is that this is a development of late capitalism, you know, another form of neoliberalism, but we see that profit generation in the ways we understand it traditionally is not the only thing that is going on. It is the return on investments, um, the kind of extractive processes, right? So how did the workers deal with this sort of amplified crisis uh, that has been created by the financialization of the hotels? Um, though Hawaii did better than other states, uh, of course, workers were extremely alarmed. Soon after Hawaii's tourism shut down, um, many of the furloughed local five members joined a collaborative project with the D uh, Department of Health uh, in order to set up the EVLA Temporary Quarantine and Isolation Center uh, for unhoused people who may be infected. So they approached this project with what we call, uh, you know, uh, what feminists call radical care, and it's a form of praxis that extends self-care outward in order to build collective cap capacity for social change. Um, and they, what they did was they brought their expertise in cleaning, in laundry, and food service to set up this center. So it was really, you know, truly a labor of love uh, in order to deal with this immense crisis. Uh, the hands-on experience was incorporated in the very first guidelines that were issued to respond to the pa pandemic for the hotel industry, and it was called Safe Hotel, Safe Hawaii. Um, and with that report in place, which was done in you know, collaboration with the physician, workers positioned themselves as key collaborators with the state and local governments, with uh, you know, business stakeholders um, and you know, uh, others in the community. Uh, the hope was that they would be part of the planning, the implementation, the evaluation and enforcement of health and safety protocols in the middle of COVID. Uh, did this happen? 
I think you know the answer. Uh, how did the industry and the state respond as they move forward with their eco economic recovery plan? So, you know, the, the TQIC, the uh, Temporary Quarantine and Isolation Center, uh, its success was touted uh, in reports. There was a white paper that was issued, uh, you know, by one of our departments in the, uh, in, at the university, but the radical care of hotel workers was completely erased. And this is one of the risks uh, that, that one runs with radical care because it can be easily co-opted by the state and you know its invisibility can be normalized. So it took a month after the Safe Hawaii, uh, the Safe Hotel, Safe Hawaii, uh, you know, guidelines for the Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association to issue its own guidelines, and they did so under immense pressure and repeated calls from Local Five. The guidelines were an exercise in branding Hawaii as the safest des destination that you could go to in the pandemic. Um, it misappropriated Hawaiian terms to characterize the ways in which the workers should service their guests. And it made workers responsible for their own safety in, a, in the middle of a pandemic that we have you know, never dealt with. So that was um, what happened um, in, in, in terms of uh, the state. So, you know, when Local 5 realized that they were not going to be part of the process, the state process of dealing with the pandemic and planning for the uh, uh, reopening and economic recovery, uh, they took to the streets. They conducted rallies. They, you know, held socially distanced event uh, events. They held town halls virtually, and they kept the momentum up. Um, and you know, at one point, they decided to uh, follow the model that was being followed in other parts of the United uh, in, in 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 the United States to set up safety committees. So, Rich will be talking about the safety committees. Okay, and. Um... Uh, I just want to say that uh, the safety committees came after, uh, I'll give a shout out to ourselves, Monisha and I did a report called Workers at the Table, uh, where we were insistent that the people with the experiential knowledge of how to clean and take care of hotels uh, was not management, wasn't corporate executives, it was workers, and that workers needed to be at the table in order to implement any safety plans. Uh, to make to do the planning and the implementation. Uh, however, uh, corporations, the financial sector, and the government, uh, under the influence of lobbyists, uh, purposefully and completely uh, shut workers out from any of the planning. So there, there were no workers involved. Uh, and um, what the workers did uh, was actually really proactive, and uh, they had a lot of foresight probably from getting shut out of planning and discussions of things that they had the knowledge of before. Uh, so they formed safety committees that were modeled after the uh, committees that uh, 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 Amazon workers in Minneapolis and meat packers in Wisconsin had formed uh, using both state law and union contract. Not all of the safety, the other safety committees were on unionized uh, properties. Uh, so, for example, Amazon wasn't, and I don't, I'm not sure about the meat packers. Uh, but uh, in Hawaii, uh, there was a safety clause in every contract, and there's also a state law saying workers don't have to work in unsafe conditions. So, COVID definitely qualified as an unsafe condition, uh, and um, uh, so what they did was set up safety committees and uh, the safety committees did two things. One was peer education and the other was site inspections. So let's talk about those in turn. Uh, local five members used their safety committee meetings to educate each other on COVID-19 safety procedures and the contract. They empowered themselves with the knowledge they needed to make hotels safe to reopen. Uh, so Carmelita Joy Melagrito, a furloughed house work, housekeeper at a high-end resort, testified to collective change when she said, while I was staying at home during the pandemic, I was an active member of Local 5 Safety Corps Committee at my hotel. We did the regular safety inspections of the hotel to make sure it was ready to reopen safely, as well as delegations with the management about safety protocols. As part of the delegation process, I attended the interest-based problem-solving training uh, I was also involved in safety bargaining with management to establish a safety agreement 
management agreed on training and educating workers about COVID-19 before going back to work. Uh, this particular property was one of the very few that did agree to work with workers to develop their safety plan, uh, and they were ostracized uh, by the other hotel owners for doing so. Uh, we often heard from uh, Melagrito at the safety committee meetings the training that she got was sponsored by the union and it focused on developing the leadership of its rank and file members and inspired her to take leadership. So people were in the ranks educating each other about COVID, uh, fighting misinformation that, you know, because that circulated and then they would discuss it and a lot of uh, bad information was corrected. Um, so the site inspections, uh, involved going to a property and it's in the union contract that a safety committee can go to a property and inspect the whole property. So that's part of the contract and uh, workers took advantage of this to form safety committees and um, uh, inspect the hotels. Um, what they found is that the hotels before reopening were grossly unprepared uh, to reopen. Uh, all of the effort went into uh, uh, making the front of the house look good, the place where tourists would be, uh, to give the appearance of safety, uh, while the back of the house, places like kitchens and uh, laundries and stuff like that, uh, the conditions were deplorable. Uh, so I actually went on one of the site inspections and I uh, partic paid particular attention to the kitchen area uh, because I was a cook for 15 years before I got some sense and went back to school. Uh, but I learned how to cook really well. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so we went on a site inspection and let me just walk you through what this is. So this is about a two, two and a half foot wide galleyway uh, with uh, burners, a uh, grill, a uh, very hot broiler called a salamander that goes up to six, 700 degrees. And then down at this end out of the picture, a uh, fryer station and under here, a steam table where things like vegetables and uh, sauces would be. Uh, they make the meals and put them up under the heat lamps and the waiters pick them up. Uh, so uh, this line is narrow. So they could possibly keep social distance if they stayed at their station all night. Uh, but if you run out of something, uh, you either have to pay an extra person to be a runner, which didn't happen under short staffing, or you have to squeeze past somebody in the line uh, and you can't do social distancing under those conditions. Uh, the galleyway for the waiters was similarly confined. Uh, and, you know, there's just no way to keep social distance here. Now, uh, U Hero at UH uh, reported early on that uh, even with all the safe travels in place, once things reopened, hundreds of people would still get through all the vaccine requirements and uh, screening and uh, testing requirements. Uh, hundreds of people per month would get through with active COVID infections. Uh, so what happens is uh, customers come in, a uh, customer will contact, be, you know, a, a few dozen to 50 people during a day. Uh, so one person can actually cause a pretty large outbreak. Uh, and it spreads in these confined quarters in the back of the house that were ignored uh, uh, by the, um, the safety protocols that management put in. Uh, actually, one place they didn't ign ignore it was they, they called for a deep cleaning of the whole kitchen area every day. Uh, a deep cleaning of a kitchen area actually closes the kitchen down for the whole day. So they wanted to close the kitchen down to clean it every day for the whole day, um, <laughs> which isn't very good for business. Uh, so uh, that's the kind of things where workers could have sorted that out very quickly. Um, and they did. They put together a site. I, I actually designed the prototype for this and then Paula Rodellis at Local 5, she was the communications director at the time. Uh, she built the actual site where, oh, well, that was exciting. Uh, uh, she built the actual site. Oh, come on. Uh, it's scrolling when I don't want it to. Uh, the actual site that um, 
uh, workers actually reviewed and gave the safety inspection reports uh, online for anyone to read. So the hope was that tourists uh, would pay attention to this and demand change. Uh, and um, uh, so the 31 safety inspections that they undertook were all here. Not all the safety inspections, by the way, were on union properties, but they couldn't get access to the back of the house at non-union properties. So I just wanted to point out that Local 5 has a long history of working for the larger good, not just solely for the benefit of the union, but for all workers. Uh, so that was where they put their money where their mouth was. And with that, I will turn it back over to Monisha. So as you see, uh, the safety committee underscores the very painstaking and time consuming work um, that uh, is required in opening up these hotels safely. And, you know, the safety committees really sort of demonstrated radical care in action. But the hotels neither had the time nor the inclination to complete these tasks in their rush to reopen. Ignoring all alternatives, and there were excellent alternatives, alternatives like the Feminist Economic Recovery Report, like the Aina Aloha Futures, uh, you know, plans. Uh, they threw all these cautions to the wind, as well as you know, protests by Native Hawaiians. Um, and what happened was that the governmental and lobbying conclave, like, just focused on reopening as the magic bullet. So mounting pressure from the Honolulu business leaders and the finance, you know, the lobbying sector led to the October 2020 reopening and this morbid correlation between tourist revenues and COVID deaths emerged as a result. Uh, we wanted to share a few highlights of what happened during this period and that's the next slide. Um, so on uh, local five side, uh, workers continued to uh, you know, press for their safety to get back to work safely. They didn't give up on that. And one of the things that they have continuously asked for is that the standard operating procedures, which is, you know, the protocols that need to be followed, especially during the pandemic, be made public that everybody know, not, you know, something that is secret. Um, so, you know, they, they kept demanding that. And it once the state reopened, uh, Governor Ige passed Proclamation uh, 15, which in fact didn't do what it was supposed to do. It devolved you know, all responsibility from the state level to the local level, to the county level. And it also privatized the standard op operating procedures by saying every hotel is responsible for publishing its own safety protocols. So that push for standardization that is very necessary to keep that pandemic in check you know, was completely uh, punctured by, you know, this, this proclamation. And of the uh, 277 hotels that Rich found in census reports, only 48% actually did go ahead and, or for, no, 48% did not publish their standard operating procedures in any kind of public space um, that, that is accessible to the public. The next thing that uh, Local 5, you know, did in the 2020s, like soon after, we, you know, uh, building up uh, with the reopening is insist on workers recall rights. And this is something that affected all workers, not just union members, because union members do have a two year recall period, even though it's not respected, it's constantly violated. They really wanted all the working people in Hawaii who had been furloughed to have those recall rights. We brought back to work as, you know, business was reopening. Um, and this took the form of Bill 80. Uh, Bill 80 also in the context of hotels demanded daily room cleaning. And daily room cleaning is very much tied to recall, right? Because uh, a lot of times hotels, if you visited hotels at that time, they were discouraging daily cleaning and not bringing back the workers to do their jobs. Um, and Local 5 continued to, you know, sort of work on contract enforcement and negotiations, often bringing uh, grievances against particular violations. Um, so what happened with Bill, Bill 80 was that it was killed, and it was killed despite a flood of testimonies from community you know, members, from workers, saying that this is a good bill and it had been adopted in many other cities and some states like Nevada, uh, California, and Connecticut. Um, and the bill was killed by, by lobbyists, and, you know, and one of those lobbyists is the, gr grassroots, uh, the Grassroots Institute. Uh, one of the things that I forgot to mention earlier was that the reopening plan that the state adopted was taken straight from the Trump administration. And that plan was cooked up by the American en Enterprise Institute, which was heavily funded by dark money, the, you know, ALEC, 
uh, which I'm sure you know is an infamous uh, uh, the organization that you know introduces legislation. Um, so uh, we we saw that after Bill 80 was killed, uh, Local Five continued to press for recall rights. What happened was that you know as room occupancy went up, hotels were understaffed. And then that understaffing was blamed on workers. Workers were told that they were not coming back to work or they were un unwilling to come back to work. And of course, you know, Local 5 caught onto this and called out, you know, businesses for that. Um, in fact, uh, it caught Kiyoya holding a job fair uh, when 900 of Kiyoya workers were not being recalled. So they were having a job fair <laughs> so that they could hire new workers and not call back people with seniority. Um, there was also a survey that was conducted by the Chamber of Commerce um, that found that businesses were having, this was in June, 2021. It found that businesses were having a tough time to filling the positions. And, you know, this is another register at which dying to work operates. It's like, you know, why shouldn't you come back to work? You're, you're in economic trouble. So uh, come back under unsafe conditions. And uh, this is a great response to the Chamber of Commerce um, survey and its coverage uh, by former Local 5 Communications Director Paula Rodeles. Uh, and you know, she asks, where is the survey asking businesses, since COVID hit, did you decrease salaries and benefits for your workers? Are you going above and beyond to make your workers feel safe from COVID and from the belligerent customers? Many of you, you know, probably have you know, dealt with such belligerent customers in your own work. Do you provide paid sick leave, medical coverage? Are you flexible with your workers who are struggling to find childcare? So what we see is that Local 5 consistently called out hotel understaffing, even as room occupancy rose. And they continue to organize for recall rights, daily room cleaning, uh, property by property, and file grievances whenever they could. So for those who returned, uh, they were left to perform unrecognized and, of course, uncompensated additional physical and, emo and emotion work to ensure their own well-being and to ensure that the people who came as tourists to Hawaii were having a good time in a place that was going, you know, branded as the safest destination. So, you know, for both, they were on the front lines to ensure that both the pandemic wary as well as the pandemic you know, denial, denying tourists were having a good time, that they could be carefree while, you know, they themselves were putting themselves and their communities as re at risk. Uh, corporations on their part bragged about squeezing the workers, and this is very, you know, the old fashioned neoliberal, you know, uh, moves that we are also familiar with at the university where COVID, under the cover of COVID, they're putting in place permanent cuts, right? So um, here is something, two things that are very disgusting. Hilton Worldwide Holdings, uh, the CEO, Chris Nassetta, bragged, bragged about higher margin businesses by achieving labor efficiencies that the corporations discovered during COVID. And as Omicron was spreading, the park hotels and resorts promised a 3% increase on their real uh, real estate investment trusts in terms of return on investments. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rich. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm going to skip over to here. Uh, the um, the the bragging was countered by a uh, plan. Uh, Governor Ige actually uh, devolved developed the uh, uh, developed it to the counties to make five-year plans. So the five-year plans are uh, called DMAPs, uh, development something, I can't, I can never remember the acronym, uh, but it's something to do with development. Uh, and um, this is more or less what they mapped out. Uh, so, uh, Corporations lobbied for reopening. Government wanted to okay it in order to bring back tourism, which creates revenue uh, for income and taxes. Uh, and the tourists expect perfect land, water, and air. So the corporations who rent it uh, undertake something called regenerative tourism. Uh, now, this is uh, a replacement for the previous one, which was uh, green tourist tourism. Uh, so besides being green, uh, in addition to being green, regenerative tourism 
actually makes the communities in which the tourists come to the the, the tourists come to uh, better. So they care for the land, water, and air, and they care for the community. Uh, for its part, the community, because of its culture, as I mentioned before, uh, was responsible for community spread, which was causing all of the trouble. Uh, there's a great report I'm just going to throw up for a moment, if I can find my cursor. Uh, uh, I, I really recommend this report uh, because it, it kind of maps out uh, how the litany, the neoliberal litany about personal responsibility is actually a colonial tool. So um, the, the litany in Oahu was that workers and community members needed to take charge of the COVID response by practicing social distance and getting vaccinated, and they were doing a very poor job of it. Um, so this is the idea of, um, uh, hang on a second, regenerative tourism, uh, but I wanna show you what happens when we reintroduce workers into the picture. So we had this, and now we're going to reintroduce the missing workers. Uh, and, oh, wait a second. I, I wanted to redo a, a quote first. Um, so uh, the, oh, the DMAPs, which came up with this regenerative uh, workerless tourism, uh, held community engagement meetings. And there they got questions. So one question was about caring. Oahu tourism has been on the back of service industry workers, especially in the most overused destination, Waikiki. Did the steering committee, the people responsible for the DMAP, consider workers critical and unique role in regenerative tourism strategies? There was no response. Uh, they just skipped over that question. Uh, then a little bit later, Representative Amy Peruso uh, said, I'm a bit stunned by all the discussion about regenerative and tourism and the importance of aloha when workers in the hospitality industry are being treated so poorly by large corporate hotel owners. Where do fa fair labor practices fit into this vision? Uh, the moderator said, thank you. We'll take that under consideration afterwards. And then it promptly went underwater and was never heard again. There is no mention of labor in the DMAP other than that they have to learn some Hawaiian words and be nice to people. Uh, so um, now I'll go back to the map. Uh, and... We'll look at what it looks like without COVID, but with workers put back in the condition, uh, back in the situation. Um, so here, uh, basically workers are concerned with these blue parts. So uh, they're trying to secure well-being for themselves and their communities, uh, the, the communities that they belong to. Uh, they want a seat at the table with government and planning the response because it's their lives at stake. Uh, and they do all the paid care work uh, for tourists. Um, so I'm just going to skip to the next one and add COVID into the situation. Um, and when we do that uh, and focus in on COVID, Um, hang on, I'll, it'll stop looking like an octopus in a moment. Okay, uh, so COVID caused harm and death to the communities. We still don't know how, it, uh, other than community spread. So COVID is somehow entering the communities and spreading. Uh, and it was caused immediate furloughs, which are, is a reasonable thing when the hotels are closed. Uh, but those furloughs were turned into permanent cuts, as Monisha pointed out, uh, and bragged about to stockholders. Uh, this became the new normal uh, as corporations used COVID uh, to do that. Uh, the shutdown was ratcheted, as we mentioned before, and the reopening caused harm and death 
as tourists did make it through uh, with COVID and became the vector for continued infections. Um, so uh, this sort of complicated graph, once we break it down, is these three sectors, uh, what the workers were doing, uh, what the corporations and the lobbyists were doing, uh, and what was happening with COVID. Uh, so um, COVID basically worked its way into the communities, not through community spread, but from tourism. Uh, let's see, I think I'm just about done there. Um, yeah. Uh, so so um, I want to just quote a worker, Earl Kono, who worked at one of the hotel restaurants that was shut down with no plans for reopening. This is a common strategy. If they shut down the hotel, then they'll subcontract and then they don't have to have union workers at the hotel. So he said, losing my recall rights really frightens me. I'm a single father taking care of my kids and my grandson. Every night I'm on the verge of breaking down, thinking about our future. I've been hearing stories on the news about people going homeless and I don't want my family to be next. Though he had at the time no prospect of being recalled, he says of his local five work, we have to sit, stick together and fight for our jobs. We have to organize and push our managers to do something about this. Uh, so, um, for, fortunately, and because of that work, uh, the right to recall was won in the new round of com, co, uh, contracts, uh, and many hotels are now guaranteeing the right to recall up till 2024. Um, and I want to point out that working from this space, which is just outside the grasp of that financial corporate sector that we talked about, uh, it, they, they desire it, they want to consume it. Uh, but they can't quite get to it. Uh, and that's what uh, uh, scholar Nef Neferti uh, Tadiar calls remaindered life, is this space just beyond the grasp of capitalism. Uh, and she marks that as a generative and creative space uh, from which solutions that are beyond capitalism arise. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Monisha. Um, so yeah, I mean, the good news is that Earl did get his job back as a result of recall rights. Uh, and we see that despite the dysfunctional, you know, dollars for death relations between corporation, with, with the, between uh, corporate visions and, you know, local communities, workers continued to push for their safety, well-being, and they really pushed to protect their rights, not only as union members, but as working people of Hawaii. And they do so in the nexus of you know, life-threatening risks and neoliberal austerity. Workers are returning, albeit much more slowly than tourists. Uh, local five organizers continue to work property by property. And there are there have been several wins, which you know, we really need to celebrate. One that which mentioned recall rights for uh, local five members uh, extended to, uh, to August 2024. Uh, this is unusual. It's an extension beyond the two years. Uh, daily room cleaning is back. Those of you who may have seen uh, United Shades uh, you know, saw the that campaign uh, for about. daily, yeah, the daily room cleaning, and they also won better wages and benefits for workers in the, in the recent round of contracts. Uh, so, you know, this is property by property. Local five also persists in the long term demands that got completely scuttled uh, as a result of the legislature's inaction around living wage, health care, and universal child care for all working people of Hawaii. So, you know, while the parts of the assemblage are debt dealing, we emphasize Local 5's mem members' attention to interdependencies and mutuality, their well-being, they are, you know, repeatedly reminded us, is tied to their families, their communities, and tourists. Um, uh, and this is very much in keeping with Beth Ferry's provocation that we imagine autoimmunity as uh, or an act of recognition of all parts of the cell self and interdependency. And of course, we celebrate Local 5 members' life-affirming ethic of collectivity, care, spirit, and dignity in contending with autoimmune capitalism. That's it. Wow. 
how are we doing for time? I don't, uh, okay, it's four. So um, we can take some questions if you'd like. Yes. This mic, uh, yeah, we can turn it off. Yeah. So my question is with the data that you found or any other cross-referencing to other geographic places within the United States, was there any push to have legal action taken to provide the DOSA and HR requirements for safe working conditions, especially since you have, you can show proof that you have one person entity or motivation for financial gain, obviously, to keep people in the suspended state of un unsafe working conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so OSHA is not really anywhere to be found in during COVID. Uh, there, I, I didn't see any reference to OSHA taking any action regarding COVID. Uh, if they did, I, I didn't see it and I kept up with things here. Uh, as far as comparing with other areas, so um, that uh, the, the morbid chart <laughs> is taken from the Johns Hopkins data, which reports for every county in the United States. Uh, and it, I worked up tables from that for Honolulu. Uh, and also when we were doing workers at the table early on saying that, uh, you know, reopening had to be done with worker knowledge, uh, we pointed out uh, like the skyrocketing caseloads in uh, Myrtle Beach when they ignored COVID and reopened uh, in uh, Las Vegas as well. Um, so we did a little bit of comparison early on, um, but uh, every time I update this graph a month, it's a it's a, a day's oh, yeah. work. <laughs> I, th I think because you have the data there to show blatant disregard and negligence, so it seems like it would be an easy case within the civil liberties or ACLU for someone to actually, I, and I understand the position it puts those workers in because mm -hmm. they're already fighting for safe working conditions or fighting to even have their jobs back to reinstate their seniority to have something to bring home for their families. So they're already struggling with not having retribution negatively impact them in any way, shape, or form. But unfortunately, with big business, like you like you showing their data for the research and the book, that their only consequences is what's affecting the bottom line. So if they can't legally be held accountable or paid a fine or penalty for paying workers what their dignity wages should be because of the lack of safe working conditions. What other aspects could they use, could people use or entities use to hold them accountable to have better safe conditions? Okay, so yeah. I, I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah, I mean, one of the disturbing things also was, uh, you may remember, I think it was in 2021, um, that a bill was introduced in the legislature. It didn't thankfully pass. Yeah. Uh, basically, you know, protecting state from any liability. In this case, these cases were brought from the by the prisoners mm -hmm. who were being held at uh, OCC, right? Um, so the state kind of knew that it is, you know, its negligence is causing this. But you know, just the fact that they introduced this bill and tried to get it passed also shows like, you know, both its complicity and yeah. its, you know, um, and, and the ways in which it'll aggressively act to protect itself, right? Um, so, you know, we, we, we definitely mark that. And, you know, I mean, one of the disturbing things is that, you know, community spread becomes a way to obscure the state's responsibility in, you know, letting the situation uh, you know, let, letting the virus spread the way it did and, oh, you know, yeah. continuously pushing for tourism as the only solution when there are so many other ways in which to develop our economy, as we discussed in our yes. past. Yes, Emily, yeah. Emily, Liza. Yeah. Well, yeah, so thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it's just so interesting. I was remembering the graph where you talked about how, you know, like community is being blamed for community spread. And you, you had like in quotation mark culture. And I feel like um, it's like coded for, like, for example, Filipino families living together. Uh, all it's racism. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's racism. So I'm really curious because you're dealing with radical care and them creating radical care. How did culture come up as radical care for these workers? Okay, so the, the workers are inside the cultures, first off, uh, and they're the ones experiencing 
the effects most harshly both of unemployment and of COVID because they're the ones in the most contact with the vector, which is the tourists. Uh, so they have a, a very different take on this uh, than the state and the corporations and the lobbyists who want to keep business going. Uh, it's, it's the view from inside rather than uh, trying to spin it from the outside. Um, so in that sense, uh, the way Local 5 responded is from this place that we're talking about with remaindered life uh, that is kind of outside of the legal system. It's not illegal or anything, but just it's not operating in that same domain. It's operating in the space of what can we actually do with what we've got. Uh, so, yeah. Because like you, you have these like really awesome things like peer education. Were they like educating each other in kind of things? Can you talk a little bit more about how culture shows up in that way? Yeah. So I mean, uh, I don't. You know, uh, one of my students did an oral history with one of the uh, local five uh, furloughed members who was helping people to apply for unemployment, right? And uh, that, you know, the, she, she was helping with translating these very difficult documents and how to, you know, navigate those websites. You know, uh, as, as you know, um, um, uh, uh, WOW, uh, We Are Oceania, uh, they put out a number of brochures in their own languages, right? Uh, multiple languages to spread the information, not only about, you know, how COVID spreads and all of that, you know, but actually, you know, how am I going to deal with the unemployment office that is not, you know, open and I'm calling them night and day and I'm not getting my unemployment written to which I paid in, you know, I mean, this is money that the government took from the workers and they were sitting with it and some people are still trying to claim that unemployment. So um, there was a lot of translation work that went on. There was, you know, this this sort of you know real surge of needing to help one's fellow workers. You know, um, people went to uh, food, you know food pantries. There was a huge drive for food distribution. So there was all of that. But again, like as Lisa Brandonetti, who was one of our ethnic studies students and WGSS students, you know, remind us that you know um, mutual aid is you know uh, you know it's not charity. It's about collective social change. So you know they kind of were navigating that space of uh, you know, being there, you know, in a very personal and individualized way for their families, as well as, you know, sort of thinking about, you know, how do we transform these systemic, you know, failures that we are confronting at this moment? Is that a question to be answered? Or what all have, because I feel like you're trying, right? People vote better people into office. They establish bills to be put into place to help protect those who are adversely affected by greed and capitalism. And then it's like a constant stalemate. So there'll be some, but then we then pandemics happen or situations happen and show that we're further behind than we ever thought we really were. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing was very clear, as all of you know, it's like, you know, the pandemic just amplified like all the messed up stuff yeah. <laughs> that was already there. It just kind of like put it all in very stark relief. Oh, do we have any questions from online? Uh, not yet. Please, if you have them, we're here. Call that number now. <laughs> Can you explain the dummy, the dummy, the dollars chart again? Like the numbers on the chart. That was by millions. Pardon? That was by millions on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I take a picture of it? Sure. Okay. Oh, I'm, I keep changing it on my copy and not. Uh,
somewhere around here. There we go. First try. So on the side here, that's millions of dollars. Uh, yes. So the 18,000 is 18,000 million, which is 18 billion. So Rich, I was going to ask, what's the numbers for the people who are dying? On the right hand side, I, 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 I and uh, so this is per day, not per month. And it's a rolling average. Uh, so there, the, the highest spikes were much higher, uh, but they were much more erratic. Uh, actually, one day uh, there were um, 600 deaths, uh, but it was due to an accounting error. Uh, not the deaths. The deaths happened, but they didn't enter them, and they got caught and entered all at once. So I used a rolling average in order to pull out the trend line over the time. Uh, so what, we're not talking about big numbers per day, but that's like seven people every day <laughs> uh, that adds up over a month and it adds up over a couple of years. Uh, so uh, um, it kind of begs the question with the numbers on the other side is how much does the state think you're worth? Your no, life. So those are actual numbers, seven. Yes. I mean, seven people, it's not. Or well, it's a rolling average, so it's seven point something something, okay, okay. Per, day. per day. Yeah, but the but the deaths are counted. Like I, the if you go to the table, they're there each day. Um, and you know the uh, you hero report said that even after safe travels, uh, if tourism went back to half the level of pre-COVID. 370 some odd people would bring in infections to the islands. So this was, you know, you hear that is, that is working with the state that was actually invited to the table, uh, you know, already telling the governor that, look, you're gonna reintroduce infections. If you yeah, and this was June, 2020. So well before reopening. Um, so that's the foreseeable and foreseen is the kind of shocking part of this to us. Uh, and um, we're hoping to get the word out a little bit and get some traction on this. You know, I hope people will read it. I really like how you guys showed us the symbolism of numbers because it always shows um, the invisible versus the visible part. And going back to the state, one of the very first questions that you ask any legislature for presenting a bill, first thing they ask you is, well, how much is it going to cost the state? And so um, in those regards, at the city and county level for Bill 80, is there um, traction on wanting to revitalize or revamp or reword? Uh, they, they approached it through the contract instead. So they, uh, they bas the workers lost that one. Uh, it was downgraded to a resolution to save face. So it still said you should not uh, hire new workers when you can recall your own workers, uh, but it was just a, a should. There was no teeth to it. Was there a role in other unions uh, supporting you know, the same um, building? My competence my unions always gonna um, obfuscate legislation. You know, I, I didn't look at other unions. Do you know of any money? You know, my, uh, students sort of did some research. It was mostly uh, people in hospitality and food service, you know, who, who uh, went and testified for the bill. And there were hundreds and hundreds of testimonies, you know, just saying that let's let's do this, you know. Um, and there was all and, and it has been done in other cities and other states. So it was, you know, but, you know, like the folks like just say, oh, no, it's going to, you know, cause all this, these legal problems and it's too much liability. And they basically kill the bill. And there is, you know, we even found sort of an editorial that was written by this guy who's, you know, part of the Grassroots Institute, which is a conservative think tank. So, um, so, I mean, you know, like just the role of the American enterprise of ALEC, of, you know, these, these other sort of, you know, very conservative, very harmful think tanks. Again, like we have to dig it up to find uh, yeah, so know, the role that they play. It's important here to kind of underscore the, the ultra rich investors who provide the dark money for these lobbying groups, uh, along with 
in uh, the leveraged loans. So they invest along two different channels. Uh, and it's, it's seen as an investment. They basically buy out the government. Um, yeah, and you know, uh, Cade had told us that in ordinary times, you know, there isn't uh, there isn't a lot of lobbying money that is put into tourism because it's just you know a part of the economy, and you know, uh, that that it's not a threat. But with COVID and with these alternative plans and with you know the the sort of shutdown, um, there was a huge influx of lobbying money to um, make sure that everything reopened and business went and to stayed show. open. <laughs> yeah, that was the other thing. I mean, do you remember, like, we were supposed, like, we were supposed to sort of um, calibrate the reopening to positivity rates, right? And that never happened. <laughs> yeah, it was just kind of a flat out lie. So that's uh, that's one thing I, I I have a hard time comprehending is that this stuff is obvious in hindsight but people who are supposed to be experts in this should be able to look at what the projections are for island populations that are dependent on tourism during pandemics there's like 10 papers on this uh and see what was going on and the what what besides that uh proposed bill to let all of the legislatures off from any liability for covid deaths that didn't pass. Uh, uh, just the way that COVID was presented every time, uh, they always looked for a local source of any outbreak. Uh, and and that that uh, personal responsibility language, uh, which is the language of colonialism in the neoliberal era. Like uh, it's uh, the people that are most affected on it, uh, by it negatively are the ones uh, that are held liable, the, the most vulnerable people too. So how are we doing for time? All right, so what time are we done? Around now. Around now? Okay. You guys want to finish up? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. This is the first time we presented on this work, so thank you.